Hey guys, in this care plan, we are going to discuss the basics of providing care to a patient who has a renal calculi. So specifically, what we're going to look at is a description of this diagnosis. We're going to look at subjective and objective data, and then your nursing interventions with rationales. Okay, so renal calculi are more commonly known as kidney stones. Um, and these kidney stones actually form when crystallized minerals like calcium or uric acid um, get built up and they stick together um, in the urinary tract, okay? So um, when this happens, um, this can cause a problem and create a blockage in the urinary tract, okay? Um, sometimes if they're small enough, these stones may pass through the urinary tract or again, if they're large, they may get stuck and require surgical intervention. Um, there are some important risk factors to be aware of for um, developing kidney stones. So the major one is gonna be dehydration, but you also wanna think about things like infection, diet, and sometimes they're just hereditary. Okay, so your desired outcomes for patients who have kidney stones are number one, to try and promote normal voiding of urine. And what we mean by normal is really that they experience as little pain as possible, okay? Um, and then we really need them to pass that kidney stone um, without experiencing traumatic injury. Okay, so let's take a look at the care plan. So your subjective data for renal calcula are first and foremost, severe pain of back and side. You may hear this called blank pain, okay? Um, and then you may also have patients that complain of pain that radiates sort of from the lower abdomen into the groin. And nausea is common as well as pain with urination, urinary frequency, and urinary urgency. Your objective data here are hematuria, so if you uh, notice that there are any red blood cells in the urine, um, cloudy, foul-smelling urine, and fever if they have an infection. Okay, so like we said, kidney stones can cause severe, severe pain. Um, so it's very important that we go ahead and get a baseline pain assessment so that we can monitor for effectiveness of our treatment. Um, so to help us do that, we need to assess for pain um, and then go along with our interventions to relieve that. Now, the top ways that we can help relieve pain are first and foremost to sort of help with positioning. Um, so to get the patient um, in positions that are comfortable, we need to then assist them with ambulation and offer any medications that may be helpful. Now, one additional thing about pain that's really, really important is to pay attention to the location of the pain and the character of the pain. This can sometimes help us know if the stone is moving. Now, when the pain's really severe, it's not uncommon for patients to also experience nausea and vomiting, so we may need to treat that as well. Okay, so next in your assessment, you want to be looking for signs and symptoms of infection. So we're assessing the patient and looking for things like malodorous urine, fever, chills, and hematuria. Okay, so next we need to be monitoring for dehydration. Okay, so remember that dehydration is one of our risk factors for developing renal calculi, um, and it can make things a lot more complicated. So we need to assess the patient's hydration status um, and make sure that we're paying attention to things like um, their nausea and their vomiting, because that could make things worse as well. Okay, next, if we know that dehydration is a problem, we want to hydrate the patient by encouraging intake of fluids. Um, it's gonna help with some of their symptoms and it's also gonna possibly help move that stone along. So it's very, very important um, that we make sure the patient's getting plenty of fluids. Now, as we are increasing the patient's fluid intake, hopefully the patient's gonna be going to the toilet a lot more frequently um, and hopefully moving that stone along their urinary tract and hopefully out of the body. Um, so it's really important that during this process, we monitor the urine output very, very closely, first to see how much they're having, and then second, we're gonna be looking for evidence of stones in the urine. So this means that every time the patient um, voids, we need to be in there assessing that to see if there is any evidence um, that stones have been passed. So the patient's gonna need a urinary hat in the toilet um, with something in there that's gonna catch those stones so that we can assess and see if that's, that's happening. So in some cases, diagnostic tests may need to be done um, to help us monitor kidney function and to assess the location of the stone. The common tests that you're gonna see are potentially serum, BUN and creatinine, urinalysis, hemoglobin and hematocrit and CBC, the KUB x-ray, which is just looking at the abdomen, 
um, an ultrasound, and possibly even a CT scan. Now there's a lot you could look into that, but the main thing to be aware of with these diagnostic tests is to just know that with your BUN and creatinine, you're gonna see those levels elevated in the serum, and they're gonna be decreased in the urine. Okay, so for your BUN and creatinine, they're gonna be elevated in the serum and decreased in the urine. Now, if the patient isn't able to pass the stone on their own with their increased hydration, they may need um, actually to have surgery um, or a procedure of some kind to remove them. So we definitely need to prepare them for this possibility. So your common procedures for this are an ESWL, which stands for extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, um, and then you might have a nephro nephrolithotomy or a ureteroscopy. Okay, so those are kind of three things that you may see. The ESWL sends shockwaves through the kidneys to break up the stones. And then the other two procedures um, are actually surgical to go in and remove them. So the thing with the um, this procedure here is that the patient's still going to have to pass those stones that have been broken up, whereas with the two surgical procedures, they're going to go ahead and remove them. Okay, once we get those stones out and the patient's not having those problems anymore, it's important to educate them on their diet to help prevent the future development of stones. So we're gonna provide some nutritional education. Um, and the types of foods they need to avoid may, may vary based on the type of stone that they have. So you can get calcium stones, uric stones, cysteine stones, or oxalate stones. But the main dietary items that um, come into play with the stones are um, having too much protein, too much sodium, too many purines in the diet, and too much oxalate in the diet. So you want to think about educating them on those different elements. So um, foods that are high in oxalate are things like strawberries, spinach, chocolate, tea, peanuts, things like that. Um, things that are high in purines are organ meats um, is probably the most common one. So those are the kinds of things you want to make sure that patients are aware of. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.